Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, our Redeemer. May these words be your words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're looking at the third missionary journey of Paul, really going through the end of the book of Acts. I know we've kind of, uh, in terms of looking at chapter 9, which is the conversion of Paul to the end of Acts, you know, three weeks is really fast. But as, as we get started, I want to kind of give you a description of Paul to put in perspective um, the nature of Paul's ministry. Uh, Paul probably would not have much of a following today. He had an irritating voice and a rather direct demeanor. He um, was most likely single. He was bald, bow-legged. He was short, probably. We know he was less than five feet, probably about four, six. That, even for that day, that was short had a big hooked nose. It says, one writer says, an unbroken eyebrow that lay across his forehead like a dead caterpillar. (laughs) Onesiphorus uh, says this, um, after describing him, he says, Paul was full of grace, and at times he seemed like a man, and at other times like an angel. It was not Paul's looks that defined his success. It was Paul's passion, his willingness to preach the gospel and follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, even when the Holy Spirit led him into danger. Um, And the follower, those early followers of Jesus Christ, saw the commitment, the passion of Paul and realized that the joy that Paul had was not because he was safe, it was because he had a Lord and a purpose with that Lord. <clears throat> okay, so let's quickly go through the third missionary journey. It's the longest of the missionary journeys, uh, probably almost five years, 3,500 miles. And we have a map up here. Um, if you'll notice, The first part of the journey is three separate uh, sections. First part of the journey goes through the the purple and the uh, green areas, Galatia, and uh, he ends that part of the journey over in what's called Asia on the coast in Ephesus, and he spends um, at least two years, maybe three years in Ephesus, and we'll, we'll come back to that. The second part of the journey, he travels up around the Mediterranean through Macedonia, into Achaia, which is now Greece, uh, and there visits Corinth, and then retraces his steps, that's the third part of the journey, all the way around the coast, getting on a ship, coming to Jerusalem, and there he is arrested and imprisoned. At every stop, the churches were growing and attracting new members. But Paul found something he did not anticipate. In in some of the churches, they had lost sight of the fundamental message of the gospel and instead were arguing about (laughs) non-essentials. It kind of reminds me of the church today. How often do we get caught up in the non-essentials? It is the message of the gospel that makes us the church. It is the message of the gospel that makes us the people of God, the people of Christ. Let us not be caught up in the non-essentials that divide us. Especially in Ephesus and Corinth, Paul found that the churches and individuals had been influenced heavily by the culture. Now, in Corinth and in Ephesus, there were two of the largest um, pagan temples And so it was the competition with those pagan temples that created tremendous problems in both Corinth and Ephesus. In fact, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, the book of Acts reports, as Jana, I think she read that part of the passage, um, there were only 12 left, 12 men 
were left in the church. <clears throat> and they were followers of John the Baptist. They had lost the words of Jesus and now only focused on repentance and the law. So, for at least two years, maybe three years, Paul stayed in Ephesus to preach and teach. And it is here, as the book of Acts records and tells us the story, that we really see the core message of Paul. And we take this core message and we can go to each one of his letters and he repeats it again and again and again. Preaching Jesus who was raised from the dead. Preaching the message of the one God who through the name of Jesus transformed lives and offered eternal life. Preaching Jesus who taught not only right living but love and acceptance. Preaching the Christ whose love was so deep he died for us and through his death and resurrection offers us eternal life. That's the core message. That's the core message. Those are the essentials. If we have that, all of the rest is just stuff. Jesus who's raised from the dead, the one God who through the name of Jesus transforms lives and offers eternal life. Jesus, who taught not only right living, but also love and acceptance. The Christ, whose love was so deep, He died for us. And through His death and resurrection, offers everlasting life. This missionary journey ends in Jerusalem. Paul had collected, during the third missionary journey, offerings for the Jerusalem church, which is kind of the home church of the, of the Christian movement. And he planned to stop in Jerusalem to present the funds to the Jewish leaders. But Paul is warned that the Jews were waiting to arrest and execute Paul. The rumor was well known around the Mediterranean that they were out to get Paul. But here we see in the book of Acts a picture of Paul's determination to follow the will of God no matter how risky it might be. And as he meets the leaders from Ephesus and Miletus, he responds to them with that faith and conviction. Paul responds this way in Acts 20. And now as a captive of the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. Paul repeats this message in Caesarea Philippi, I mean, in Caesarea, excuse me, in Greece, before he leaves. There, a prophecy is shared of what is going to happen to Paul, and he says, What are you doing, <laughs> weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm not, for uh, I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we remain, the church, silent, except to say, the Lord's will be done. I believe that Paul continued to Jerusalem despite the warnings because he wanted to set an example of faith and fortitude for those early believers. Paul welcomed what was ahead because he believed that God would use whatever happened for God's glory. I, I truly believe that Paul expected to be executed in Jerusalem. But Paul also believed that God would use this execution to, uh, to increase the gospel. What follows is an amazing series of events. Paul is not executed in Jerusalem. He is arrested. But through his arrest, he is able to give testimony to people that he never thought would be possible. He's arrested by the Jewish council, and he asks to give testimony to them. And basically what he does is he gives his faith testimony as a defense and some are converted. 
Then the Romans, realizing that Paul is a Roman citizen and that the Jews are going to execute him, they take custody of him and transfer him to Caesarea Philippi up on the coast. And for two years, Paul becomes this hot potato uh, being passed from one governor to another because they don't know what to do with him. He's a Roman citizen, and the, and the basic accusations and, and charges against him are from the Jews, not from the Romans. And in the process, he's able to give testimony to, <clears throat> um, to King Agrippa, to Governor Festus, to Governor Felix, to Roman guards, to prisoners. It's absolutely incredible how God was using what, Paul, what was happening to Paul. We can guess that the year to be about 59 A.D., when Paul is put on a prison ship bound for Rome. And Paul had the right, as a Roman citizen, to ask for a hearing before the Caesar or the Caesar's council, which would mean him being transferred to Rome. And so this prison ship is going to go to Rome where uh, he'll have his trial. And, <clears throat> and what happens is it's shipwrecked on Malta. And again, in the 18 months that he's there, he's able to give testimony to the other prisoners there, give testimony to the, to the citizens of Malta, give testimony to the guards. And most, if not all, are not only converted, but many are healed of afflictions. Finally, around 62 AD, he finds himself in Rome under house arrest, probably being taken care of by John Mark. This is where the book of Acts ends. Now, we know from other historians what probably happened to Paul after that house arrest. In Rome, about 64 A.D., uh, Nero was Caesar, following the fires that burned Rome almost to the ground because Nero wanted to rebuild Rome in his image. And he was blaming it on the Christians, and he needed a scapegoat. And he, re- and he finds out that Paul, the Christian leader, is under house arrest. So he brings him in, convicts him, and, and sentences him to death, and puts him in the Mamertine prison. Now, the Mamertine prison was the worst prison in the Roman Empire. It was horrible. In fact, many of those who went to the Mamertine prison awaiting execution would die of exposure or starvation. It was horrible. The way you would get into the cells is that they would lower you through a grate down into the cell, and then they would just dump your food, not on any plate, but through the grate down on the floor for you to eat. It is here that Paul continues to give testimony to his followers. They would come to the prison and listen to him through the great grate. It is here that he dictates the letter of hope and promise and, and joy to the church at Philippi, Philippians. <laughs> Paul saw joy not as safety or comfort but the fulfilling of a purpose. And I think this is why people followed him and would follow him anywhere, because they saw his conviction and his belief that no matter what was thrown at him, God was going to use it for God's purposes. So here's what I see. Paul saw saw opportunity in every problem between the letter, between the, between the word, ah, between the lines in his letters, Paul writes these questions. What is God doing with this? Where is God? How can God be glorified in me? You know, ask, ask ourselves for a moment. What if we lived with the kind of conviction? There's a billion Christians around the world. What if we spoke? What if every step we took was with the same conviction, faith, and passion that Paul had? Would our world be a better place? 
How might God use us? What can we give to our situations? How can God be glorified? And, and second, Paul's perspective on life gave him hope. Paul knew that the glory and promise of Christ was p- far greater than anything the world could dish out to him. For Paul, a problem was an opportunity. <laughs> an opportunity. An opportunity to share Christ. An opportunity to expand the gospel. And, and frankly, that's what his life represented. A whole set of problems that were transformed in a grand testimony. For Paul, pain was an affirmation of great things to come from God. For Paul, again, joy came not through safety or comfort, but through purpose and sacrifice. And then finally, the importance of the fellowship and support of other Christians. There were always those who encouraged Paul, surrounded Paul when he needed help, stayed with him, nursed him, were with him to minister to him while he was under house arrest. They were drawn to Paul not because of how he looked, not because of how he sounded, not because of his demeanor, but because of his joy. They had seen him suffer for their sakes, and they were willing to go to any length to stand by Paul's side and the gospel Paul preached. A pastor by the name of Bob Perks shares a story of being at Walmart one day when a huge thunderstorm hit while he was about to go into the parking lot. It was one of those gully washers where, you know, it goes over the, uh, over the gutters and just absolutely, uh, because of the sound of the rain, you can hear nothing but the rain itself. Well, as as Pastor Perks was standing there underneath the awning, others came out, and others, until it was crowded. They were waiting for the rain to let up. There was a little girl, red-headed, freckled. She broke the kind of buzz that was a part of this group. She said, Mom, let's run through the rain. What? Her mom said, let's run through the rain. No, honey, we'll wait till it slows down a bit. Mom, let's run through the rain. We'll get soaked if we do, said her mom. No, we won't, Mom. That's not what you said this morning. Mom was confused. She said, wait a minute. This morning, when did I say we could run through the rain and not get wet? Don't you remember? Don't you remember, Mom, when you and Dad were talking about his cancer? And you said, if God can get us through this, He can get us through anything. Now the crowd was silent. They were totally focused on the little girl and the mom. What would she say? How would she respond? Honey, you are absolutely right. Let's run through the rain. And if God lets us get wet, then maybe we just need washing. And so off they ran, smiling and laughing, splashing in the puddles, darting past the cars, and they got soaked. They were followed by one, and then another, and then another. Pastor Perk said that he finally ran out into the rain to get drenched himself. And as he looked back, all the rest of those who were gathered under the awning were headed toward their cars, laughing and splashing. They all got wet. I guess they needed washing. Circumstances or events can take away our material goods. They can take away our money. They can take away our health. 
But none, no one, no situation can take away the love of family and friends, the care and love of our Heavenly Father, the promise of God's presence and coming glory. I had a good family, but this family, this family, my church family, has always been there for me. And I will always love you for that. I do. There are a lot of things I don't know, but one thing I do know, the rain will always come. Hard times are just a part of life. But God will provide a way to make it through to the other side. So don't forget to take time each day as you face whatever it is to say something, to do something, to just laugh in the face of the problems that life brings. For when we do, God smiles. Let's be known by the joy of our Lord that comes through our full and unwavering commitment to the way of Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you and praise you for your spirit, for your love, for your grace, and for the story of Paul. May we, in some shape or fashion, live our lives with such conviction, with such passion, with such faith, that there is nothing that shall separate us from your love. Amen.